All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for holding on. Uh, we are super excited for this evening finally taking place. Welcome to Factory Berlin. There are people here. Yes! <laughs> for those of you who do not know us, we are a community of over, over 3,000 creators and innovators from 70 different nationalities that are here to collaborate, share their network, build peer-to-peer -peer relationships, and essentially design the future. Um, we're also here to celebrate the pitch event for our first Stealth Mode program. The mentorship program that we brought to life three months ago focused on aspiring female founders. And the whole point is that it connects people at the inception point of their idea and brings that idea to an MVP. So we launched it to address the dire lack of female founders in the tech space and really want to attract a lot more ambitious young women uh, and help them materialize their ideas and really provide an environment of comfort and success. And so tonight is really the culmination of this first edition and we're incredibly thrilled because it's also the first time they're actually physically together in one space. So it's wild. We launched Stealth Mode uh, a week prior to, or a week into COVID-19, meaning that we had to bring everything online. It was supposed to be an on-site event. We brought everything online, and so our mentors and mentees and all the supporters really uh, came together and made this happen and, uh, and pulled through phenomenally. Before we get started, I want to thank two women that are really uh, fundamental and monumental in bringing this whole thing to life. That is, uh, Aino Pitola and Mercedes <laughs> Valles. <laughs> Can't pronounce too many names. <laughs> thank you so much for all your hard work on this. Um, and thank you for all the stellar mentors that are uh, helping out, that helped out in this first cohort, and then we'll continue in the second, in the second edition to this. Uh, on that note, we just opened up the applications for Stealth Mode 2, so have a look online, check out the mentors, and please uh, send your friends, apply. We really want to see another strong batch of women uh, come through this and, and work through this with us. So before we get started on the pitches, we have two things happening. We are going to put some context in what the German startup landscape looks like and why there is a dearth of female representation in the German startup space. So we have uh, Dr. Alexander Hirschfeld here from the German Startup Association, and he's going to be giving us that overview. And then afterwards, we're going to do a brief panel to talk about the importance and the power of networks. So help me in welcoming Alexander. <laughs> Yeah, hello everyone, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be at this incredible event uh, presenting uh, the main results of the Female Founders Monitor, which is a project, a project we did uh, three, for three years in a row by now, uh, the German Startup Association together with Google for Startups. Uh, the idea behind it being obvious, uh, so far so much talent, uh, so much ambitious people, women, and all this talent on it, all of it, but most of it uh, not getting into the startup scene, not uh, becoming founders, uh, creating successful and big uh, businesses. And that's the idea be behind the Female Founders Monitor, to make that um, happen and to make it happen much more often. Um, yeah, first of all, what's the goal of the Female Founders Monitor? Um, one thing uh, to get an idea about uh, the motives and about the sectors uh, women are, are uh, creating their businesses in and also uh, make them more, more visible in the startup scene and the startup sector in general. Um, second, identify challenges and there are a number of uh, crucial challenges within the startup scene that need to be tackled to make, uh, to make this more open, uh, to, to um, increase the chances for women in the startup sector. And third, and most importantly, to create a momentum um, in the scene, but also in wider politics to get more women in tech, but also to get uh, more women in uh, leadership positions in big businesses now and also in the future. Um, yeah, the first and I would say most important insight is the proportion of uh, female founders in the startup sector in Germany. Uh, when you look at um, all the startups, at all, all the startup founders, you only have a percentage of uh, 16%, uh, which are women at the moment. And, um, and this number has only increased very slightly over the last couple of years. So. That's the bad news, and I would always point out that the good news, on the other hand, is that there is a lot of potential. 
So, I mean, uh, the, the men basically, uh, they're already in the sector, all the good ideas are, are already uh, became a business model, a startup, and on the other hand, the women, which have uh, the same amount or even more great ideas, um, haven't um, haven't been in the sector uh, to to the same degree, so a lot of potential uh, that needs to be uh, that needs to be realized in the next couple of years. Um, what do female founders focus on? They focus on a broad range of field, uh, strong focus in in the B two C sector, in certain se uh, industries. Um, but what you can also see concerning motives that there is a, a strong focus on sustainability. Um, social economy, green economy, um, this is a, a focus besides like the economic one uh, on the business model on software and stuff like that, but the social and also the sustainable aspect is very important for female founders. And that we also see in our data that uh, there's a huge proportion of female-led startups, especially in the health sector and also uh, in education and fields like that. Um, coming from the characteristics of the startups and also female founders from the first big challenge, uh, which is financing. And when we look at funding into our data, we can see that there is a big difference uh, when we compare male teams with female teams. For example, when you look at um, startups that raised one million or more in Germany, you only have 5% female teams who did that and 28% uh, uh, male teams who were able to achieve that. So you have a huge gap uh, when it comes to funding. And uh, one explanation that you always hear or that you hear from time to time is that there are different sectors, different aspirations. Um, so in the last study, we also asked um, what kind of funding do you want to get? For example, do you want to get business angel money? Do you want to get money from VC? And there we realized that it's not true that there are different aspirations and that uh, women don't want to get that kind of money, the big tickets, they also want to get them, but at the moment there is a big gap between like the aspirations on the one hand and actually realizing that kind of funding on the other hand. And that's why uh, networks, events like, like this one are so important to kind of um, get this uh, gap closer and uh, increase the chances within the sector. Um, the other important aspect um, which I already touched on on the on the slide before, uh, the importance of networks. And we looked at a number of different aspects, but focused strongly on the one hand on uh, networks to uh, the investment sector, and on the other hand on networks to the established industry. And one number which, which strikes me is um, that 57% uh, of the women led teams are saying in Germany that they have a huge difficulty accessing, accessing uh, in investors and the investment sector. And for male teams, it's only 37%. Though also, you see this huge gap when it comes to the network and to get in touch basically with the people who can, uh, can make this happen um, and also uh, to, to have a better access to, to the funding sector. And the other thing is uh, the network uh, to established um, companies that you see uh, on the right side, which is which has kind of the same uh, the same pattern. And the last thing I want to talk today a little, and that was already mentioned um, before, uh, COVID, the Corona crisis. Um, in June, before we uh, uh, published our study, we were thinking, um, how does COVID, how does Corona kind of uh, affect female founders um, in Germany? Um, and we, I mean, we had an idea in mind, but we weren't sure what uh, the data would tell us um, uh, would, would tell us in the end. So we asked in our network, uh, "What is your uh, idea? What do you think? How does uh, Corona, how does the current crisis affect you and affect female founders and that's the chances in the startup system more generally?" And what was interesting is that most of the female founders, most of the women we asked, that it has either no effect or, and that was the vast majority, that it had a negative effect um, on the chances of women within the startup ecosystem. And I think this is because, and that's also proven by our data, that um, the, the crisis had a big effect, uh, effect on um, the work-family balance within uh, families, and f especially for female founders, because they still uh, take on the majority of work at home, and like, uh, gender stereotypes, role models, uh, we all we always talk about that um, that has to change and especially in the startup ecosystem it's very important that it changes because men and women need to have the same time and the same resources to put into their business and, and at the moment that's not the case. Yeah, And this is very important. 
So summing up, uh, I think first of all, we need more female founders and that's why events like this is so, are so important for the ecosystem um, to get like uh, the most talent uh, out of it and get all the potential um, into, into business and into great uh, ideas for the future. Uh, one obstacle, I think, are cultural factors, especially when you think about the corona crisis. There are still stereotypes out there, still role, uh, role models that we kind of get rid of, um, especially, uh, I would say, the men, but everyone has to work basically on that. Uh, structural factors are the se second aspect, I think, which are very important. And the, the key word here, I think, is uh, networks, and that's what the panel that is following is going to be about. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Alexander. You can grab a spot. I'm going to get the other two panelists on stage. Lara, would you come join me? And Laitha, please. So Lara was a participant, or is still a participant, in Stealth Mode 1. Lara Kalashnikova. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. You're welcome. And Laitha, welcome on stage. Beloved Factory Berlin member, founder of German FinTech Super. Yes, please, over there. Um, she mentors startups with Techstars, is part of the advisory board of Co-Women Community in Berlin, as well as co-founder of Mind the Gap. You've got a lot to say. You're a huge supporter. We're really pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Wanted to focus on three things today. Finding mentors, access to capital, maintaining relationships. All right, so we're going to start with finding mentors. Obviously, this whole program is based on mentorship. What we do is we select 10 mentees from our applications, and we match them with 10 mentors based on their specific needs. It's very tailor-made, uh, hands-on. And so I'd like to hear from those of you who have done played you know, on both sides of the mentee and mentor roles, uh, what makes a good mentor? What are those attributes? Uh, how do you find one? Uh, and do you have any personal examples of great mentors? You're free to mention them or not, and why were they such great mentors? Letha, you wanna? Yeah, um, one of the things that I was thinking about, um, about mentorship is uh, availability. Um, the person uh, needs to be there for you, needs to be able to listen to you, needs to have the capacity to think about your issues uh, as a founder, your issues as a leader, your issues uh, as a, a woman who is developing her career. Um, and just as uh, Stealth Mode, I think, has created uh, a space for uh, success, I, I think your mentor needs to do the same thing. Um, and so one of the most important things I have found in mentors is that they have given me their availability. Um, and that, uh, that means that like, I have had mentors from a lot of different categories. Um, they are all further along in their careers than I have been. Um, so uh, they have been able to offer me things uh, from their experience and perspectives. But the biggest part has been just being there for me. Um, and, and that, I think, is, for me, the biggest thing in a mentor is uh, the consistency, uh, the trust, and uh, the, uh, the availability to be your fan. Yeah, yeah so I would also would like to add, um, obviously, in this program, we were introduced for so many uh, wonderful people, not only our immediate mentors, but all other participants. They also mm -hmm. serve their particular role in our development. So what is important to add uh, from this perspective is that even though majority of mentors have further ahead in their career, but they still can relate to our experience, which is very early on. Mm -hmm. So you're completely correct that the, um, just the fact that they are present in our journey yeah. is incredible incredibly important, but the fact that they can relate to our struggles that are probably they all experienced probably decades <laughs> ago, that's, um, yeah, that's a crucial part of it. I agree, and, and I think that's a really important part when you are looking for a mentor. You want to look for somebody who is maybe a step or two beyond where you are today, um, and maybe not the person who is all the way at the end of their career cycle because uh, they have much more recent experience to, to offer you. So. How is it? I mean, I'm not from Berlin. I moved here a few years ago. Berlin is full of people like me, like you, that come and go. We don't have established networks and connections mm -hmm. and access to mentors. I mean, how easy is it to find someone? Uh, yeah, outside of this program. Uh, yes, definitely not easy. And uh, I also moved to Berlin 
two years ago or so, I also moved, I didn't know anybody, and I was looking for a group of people, like-minded group of people, and actually this is how I was introduced into the factory itself. <laughs> Just to later discover that mm -hmm. I will be participating in the program here, but uh, you definitely have to just put yourself out there. There's literally no other way. So you just have to open yourself up regardless of how introverted you are or probably the mm -hmm. language difficulties you experience. But still, you have to kind of put yourself out there and try to participate as many mm -hmm. events uh, related to your industry as possible and just be open to meet new people. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about capital. You mentioned it, uh, Alexander. Women accessing capital to big issues still in Germany, not only Germany, worldwide. Investment into female-led companies, I think uh, around 2%. So that's an accurate number, I, a global number I, I read. I think it's a, it's a global number. Yeah. yeah, I don't know the number in Germany. It should be pretty similar. Yeah. yeah. So 57, almost 57% of participants in your, your survey said that they have difficulty accessing capital. Mm -hmm. How do you get in front of VCs and angels? How, how does that work? That's a really tough question, especially for someone who's not a founder <laughs> and also not a woman, but a woman. But I think uh, what you just said, putting yourself out there and also um, um, industry related talking about or talking with people who have um, also a strong interest in you and in what you are doing and kind of identify that kind of people who um, who you can kind of uh, get on, on a level of, of content, like I'm doing software, I'm doing B2B, and that kind of stuff. I think that works, and as soon as uh, it goes uh, into the details, it doesn't really matter, uh, the gender doesn't really matter. And that's, I think, a very important thing, that getting people like interested in what you're doing in, in your sector, in your business, and then, then it shouldn't matter it, at all. I, w I would agree with that. Actually, I think there's a point there uh, between both mentors and VCs. Uh, a mentor uh, gets something out of the relationship with you, the mentee, right? A VC is getting something huge out of you, the startup. So really what you need to do is to, to meet people uh, and to tell them your story, uh, to uh, show them your value and your vision uh, and how ambitious you are for growing this thing. Uh, when people see that from you, when people see your, uh, your energy, uh, they, they want to get on board with what you're doing. Uh, and, and that goes for mentors, that goes for VCs, that goes for business partners and your whole network. Last point we wanted to talk about, maintaining relationships. Strange COVID times we find ourselves yeah. in. How do we stay connected as founders? We're busy, we're building companies. How do you maintain those relationships, especially with those, those, those early on mentors that you have through the entirety of your career? And I, is it important? Yeah, it's yeah. very important, actually, especially as a founders. So you can only, um, you not only can maintain your relationship on a personal level, but on professional as well. Mm -hmm. I believe that there is a lot of businesses that can make a really huge difference towards each other. For example, somebody has a B2C, um, let's say, service, and somebody else offers them, let's say, some sort of a support in, in, in terms of developing their business. This is the way how you can also progress and enlarge their, your businesses and keep relationships as well. I would just say, like, consider having like a personal CRM, right? Like the, the thing about it is all your relationships require time. It's, it's, it's like watering your plants. You know, you can't just give your plants all the water on one day and think they're gonna grow. No, they need a little bit every week. Um, and so do your relationships. Um, so whether that's your business relationships, your partnerships, your relationships with VCs, they need to hear from you on a regular basis, uh, and, and your relationships with your mentors, all of that needs to be uh, on a regular cadence. Um, and, and yeah, I, I actually have kind of a personal CRM system that I use for that. It's a, it sounds really kind of geeky, but it, you know, it, it works when it comes to nurturing those relationships. Stay on top of it, for sure. And I think it's a real strength of women to like uh, being uh, strong in this kind of relationships because when I do my studies I always interview uh, men and women, fo female founders and male founders and um, I'm always, I always love to work with women because when I send out an email I get a respond and they are always... Uh, <laughs> Sense it, of obligation? It, it's, no, it's, it really works and especially in, in times of COVID when you don't see people face to face I think it becomes more and more important to be really on top of your contacts yeah. and that kind of 
stuff. So I mean, I think this might be a an, uh, an, uh, time at the moment where this becomes more and more important. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Okay, we're all here for the pitches, so we're going to move into pitch mode. Uh, just to clarify for the audience out there, um, if you have any questions, you are free to ask questions through Slido. The uh, name of the Slido channel is Delth Mode, so S L I dot D O. Um, we have our founders pitching for three minutes each, and then we're going to follow up with one to two questions from us or from the audience out there. Um, and so let's get going, and we're going to start with you, Lara. So we'll just kind of shimmy over here. Okay, so first off, thank you so much for having me today. And let me introduce you to T Blondie, Influencer Marketplace, Campaign Automation, and Analytics Software. So throughout my professional career, I was going through this painful weekly cycle of um, maintaining various spreadsheets, logging into various documents just to run my campaigns. When one day I asked myself, why shall any influencer marketing manager maintain various tools in order to do their job? So this is how the idea of the Blondie was born. Um, since then, we started to focusing on major problems that the influencer industry has, such as investments that are made without any confident knowledge whether campaign worked or not, the advertisers who heavily relies on third-party costly tracking and analytics tools, the overabundance of one types of channels, and when you go into the other less popular categories, you almost find nothing. And lastly, the lack of predictability and consistent performance in influencer campaigns. But these problems can be solved with high quality influencer marketing automation. Very few company seriously invest in the sector. Very few of them target small to medium sized businesses and startups. So for that reason, we decided to offer to our users a set of features that are specifically uh, built on the fundamentals of the user acquisition, such as rich discovery functionality or campaign automation that will allow users to tie the results of the campaigns towards their business goals, or analytics and tracking uh, properties that will allow to the users to have additional layer of data for the users that they acquire through the campaigns. Now, we're tackling the market of 22 billions that is predicted to reach by year 2024. In addition to that, we notice a significant changes in the mindset of influencer marketing managers. Now they're expecting more out of campaign automations, and they believe now strongly into the fact that you can actually traditionally acquire users through the influencer marketing. Okay, sorry. So basically the proprietary technology that we are building are surrounded by Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So proprietary technology that we're building are surrounded um, by a certain features that we were inspired uh, from the performance marketing channel. So for example, we will be able to offer to our users the possibility to target even the smallest subset of users or have an advantage, taking an advantage from our advertising uh, inventory that is far advanced compared to a traditional pre-roll or shout out campaign and lastly, have the campaign automation that you will allow you to have always on campaigns without having significant human resources on, on the client side. So our customer target is really wide. We're targeting everybody from the internal marketing teams to the agencies specializing in influencer marketing to the independents, basically the influencer managers. Our team is small, but very skilled. I'm coming from influencer marketing, user acquisition, and uh, traditional marketing traditional marketing sides, whether my uh, co-founder, he comes from a cybersecurity sphere and has a track record of building fintech applications. I would like to thank you for your time and welcome your questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your 
uh, idea about how you're going to grow. Um, so how are you going to acquire mm -hmm. uh, your customers? It seemed like you had a broad set of customers. Yes. Yeah, so basically right now we started with a group of test users. This is building basically a company that I pitched the, the product by myself and we we're hoping to increase this amount by a world of mouth and as well we have the free offer on our, on our tool that we're hoping to convert from the free users to the paying users up to five, from 5 to 7 percent of those. So it's a freemium offer. Okay, yes. Great. What's your competition out there? Competition is crazy. <laughs> Competition is completely crazy, but we have a certain, uh, let's say, features that uh, distinguish us from a majority of our competitors, such as basically the whole automation process of the campaigns. So we will try to provide users, users the full tools that does not require them to have a dedicated customer manager, for example, so that anybody in the company from a juniors to the heads of the marketing can use the tool and have a complete benefit out of it. And can you talk a little bit about uh, market defensibility then? How, um, how do you envision uh, keeping your uh, advantage? Keeping an advantage, well, that's first of all expanding onto various social media platforms because right now we, for example, cover a four of the major and we're going into different markets and acquire the influencers from different platforms. Mm -hmm. And obviously the machine learning and AI is a, it's a big factor that will help us to actually work deeper with the data, mm -hmm. therefore giving better, um, let's say, better results to our customers. Okay. Do we have time for another question, Charlotte? Yes. Yeah. Have you te Sorry, Alexander, do you have uh, I was just wondering if you have an, uh, can we give me an idea about pricing? Like. Yeah, so I would like to not disclose our pricing strategy right now, but, <laughs> but I encourage everybody to sign up and stay tuned to your exclusive offer, and I guarantee that the price offer and the features will completely exceed your expectation. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 I like your confidence. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, we need to disinfect the mic and the presenter. Yes, we're being careful here too. Next up, we have Sophia Schade. Yes. Sophia is just in the waiting in the. So, Flowsiety is the name of her company. And she's going to tell us all yeah, about it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so let's get started. I'm Sophia, CEO of Society, and this this is George. George is a general contractor who offers manufacturing services. Customers approach him with a design that he would turn into reality. Like a great conductor, he has to orchestrate the the, his processes with his subcontractors for production, paint, and assembly. Sounds simple enough, you might say, but it is actually a time-consuming process. Every change of plans needs to be communicated. Every adjustment has to be signed off and verified by his partner firms. Um, the communications overhead in order to change the location of a single screw can easily incur a delay of six weeks. That seems tediously inefficient and, more importantly, too costly to George and to us. We, we are society. We automate in collaboration with businesses and with partners and suppliers. Cross-company processes can finally be streamlined in a simple, safe, and fast way. Blockchain, uh, we offer, sorry, I'm a bit nervous today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have a platform to, um, to, 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 to define your workflows. Uh, by which, sorry, I'm out. Okay, one more second. We have a platform to define your workflows while uh, we can um, connect your existing infrastructure. Blockchain technology um, ensures. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so ne nervous today. Uh, yes, I have to yep. breathe for a second. Uh, so, uh, we ha have a blockchain technology ensures a secure architecture. Moreover, we have um, state of the art. Um, <laughs> we have, moreover, we have a state of the art um, cryptography, which ensures that your business's data will stay in your hand. 
For George, input from his uh, customers will be forwarded without manual interference um, so that um, ch design ch changes can be um, verified, signed off, and built with as little human input as possible, which allowed George to um, save manual labor and deliver the final product more rapidly. The most recent report of KFW Bank estimates a market size for digitalization of small and medium enterprises of almost 20 billion euros. 54% of businesses are looking to upgrade their communication with business and suppliers. And George is a real, is a real case. In fact, he will be our first customer. And, <laughs> and the connection with his partners will proliferate our services. Um, Flosciety's broad application allows us to tap the markets of logistics, professional services, and insurance. Our decentralized vendor independent approach set us apart from our competitors who um, lock you, um, who will be only um, restricted to single company automation or lock you into their um, expensive ecosystem. But most importantly, what the competition doesn't have is this great team and this nervous CEO. Um, we have Tim, who ha brings experience um, in product um, management in mid-sized companies. Thomas, Thomas, a software engineer and former astrophysicist, who takes care of the actual development of um, the platform. And finally, me. Um, I have a strong track record in IT consulting and are responsible for business development. If you are as eager on this journey to, uh, to embark on this journey as we are, we would be delighted. Um, your contribution would um, your contribution would provide runway for uh, the first product rollouts, and um, which will strengthen our brand and will pave the way uh, next to our next customers. Thank you very much. Yes, questions, please. I hope I'm off the record much better. I loved the four boxes that you had in your presentation and four, uh, four. the four boxes with IBM, Celonis okay. and stuff. Yes, okay. um, so I wanted to ask about your competition and you could probably yeah. also talk about like your unique uh, kind of approach to digitalization of small businesses. Yes, so um, you already know workflow automation already exists for a lot of years, but it's um, today, till today, um, just uh, restricted to single company automation because you have a central platform and everybody has to join the central platform. And we have a decentralized approach where everyone can use their existing infrastructure, work in their systems, and still work together. So you, the email ping pong and going to the phone and checking one number for your SAP or something like that won't happen anymore. So you have your, your um, processes in the company and you have to, can um, use your software you already used to, but still can work automatically with your partners together. So you said you, George, is a, George is a customer? Yes, George is a real How case. did you find and acquire George and convince <laughs> him, her? <laughs> yes, uh, it's a... Um, actually, I also have some uh, former customers as, uh, I, as I was a con consultant, but uh, this client came through a business angel. So we uh, were talking to with the business angel club uh, Berlin Brandenburg, and he's one of the business angels there. And uh, on one pitching event, he came up and said, okay, your idea is really great. I have a company and I think I want to use your solution. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, and how will you find more George? <laughs> yes, uh, so first of all, George has his partners, so uh, when he will um, get, this, um, get our product, every one of his partners will use um, Flosciety and get, uh, get to know the advantages, mm -hmm. and I, we hope that they will also start, uh, or start thinking of other processes they want to uh, automate with Flosciety, and um, by that we have a yeah, word of mouth, on the one hand, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, um, yeah, starting in um, different um, areas, um, like I mentioned, logistics or professional service, to have single use cases we can um, scale up for different clients. And uh, are you going to scale your team very much, or are you going to uh, rely on uh, really uh, robotic process automation for, for your own systems? 
Um, yes and no. <laughs> so y yes, we want to scale, of course. So actually, we we, na we are now right looking for two new employees, our first employees, mm -hmm. which is really exciting. And um, then we want to have a plug and play um, um, effort, so you can maybe as a customer start trying um, our platform by going there and try to use APIs uh, which are out of the box. But uh, we actually need a lot of d developers, so okay. yes. All the developers out there. Mm, yeah. Yes, we are hiring, so <laughs> check it out, Flosiety. Excellent. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next up we have Elise Cannon with her business, SAS, coming on stage. Okay, thanks for having me. So I wanna kick things off and ask you guys to take a moment. Take a breath, close your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes if you don't want to, you do you. Now step into your bathroom. Yeah, don't worry, I need to clean mine as well. No judgment, <laughs> it's fine. Um, imagine that you're getting ready for bed after a long day of listening to pitches. You're looking in the mirror and you take out your first product. How many other products do you have in that case at the same time? Have a think, I have 20. 20 that I use on a daily basis, there's even more. Like shampoo, conditioner, toothpaste, moisturizer, hand wash, et cetera, the list goes on. Now pick one. Why did you choose it? Do you trust the brand? Does it match what you care about? Did you choose it consciously? Now pick one. No, you've already got one. <laughs> so mine is cotton buds. I'm 30 years old, I use two a day. Do a quick bit of maths and boom, I've already contributed a whole bathtub full of waste. Yeah, it's a lot. And uh, I really hate waste. I don't like waste, I'm trying to do better on it. But it is really hard. I didn't know any better. But now I do, I'm gonna make a switch and hopefully save some more bathtubs full of cotton buds. So imagine if I did that, if you did that, not for one, but for 20. And we have a demand, we see it. 65% of consumers want to buy purpose-driven brands. But, and there's a big but, only 26% of consumers actually do so. So why? Why is there this gap? And it's a big gap. Look at the Pac-Man. Like, maybe it's this. So I work in data. I've done a lot of data analysis in my time. I know how difficult it is to find the right information to make a decision. This was a barrier for me, and I expect it's a barrier for you as well, and many others out there. There is a mismatch between what the consumer cares about and what the company talks about. All these claims everywhere, but who actually knows what it means? Do, what does it mean? What does it mean for you? And what does it mean for what you would like to contribute and your impact to be? This is where SUS comes into play. SUS is an intelligent recommendations engine that deciphers product labels to offer alternatives so that consumers can choose things that align with their values. We wanna bridge the gap between consumers and products. We wanna be able to empower consumers to choose products that match their values and to contribute to a more sustainable society. So the question is, are you SUS? If so, show us and we'll help you to choose more consciously. Thank you. Hit me. <laughs> okay, so how are you making money? Great question. <laughs> okay, so uh, the main thing would be affiliate links in the beginning. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit of a tech for good kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so we would have affiliate links driving revenue from there, potential revenue from the data side of things as well. But ideally what we'd want to do further down the line is have brands partner with us. So mm -hmm. brands that we were able to really like give the tick of approval that they could start to partner and we could potentially kind of like have a platform that they could show the good products that they were starting to do mm -hmm. and sustainability wise as well. That's the beginning. Yeah, makes sense. I've got another one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it sounds like you need to create a really large network 
of consumers mm -hmm. in order to attract like the brands. Yes. Um, how are you going to get that big audience of consumers? So we've just started. So soft pre-launch was like yesterday. Yep. Um, and I've actually been watching uh, products from not my friends being sent in, which is super cool. Um, we've just actually got a content strategist and a brand strategy talking about networks and relationships, people that I worked with previously who are interested in the idea. And so we're working on how we can turn this into a bit of awareness and start to have this kind of are you sus? Because it is an advocacy side of things. Yeah. Um, what we really wanna do is go for the people who already are educated in this space. So mm -hmm. they are the people who are already conscious consumers um, and we can start to go with them. Uh, and satisfy their needs, and then ideally it's like word of mouth, and we can continue to. Right. It's a right. difficult question. There's, there's <laughs> difficult. influencers. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, mm -hmm. T. Blondie. Yep. Very good. Okay. We don't have any questions from the odd this virtual audience. Do we have any questions from this audience? Alex? No. I think one more, how do you make uh, people trust you? Because it's all about trust and uh, how do you kind of achieve that? Yeah, so this is something that we're, like, is at the forefront. Um, and because the whole premise of this came from the fact that there's a lot of things being thrown at you that you just can't make sense of. Um, so what we want to do, and coming from the data background that I have, it's all around how you can provide the information. So we want to try and be as tr transparent as we can um, basically put all the information out there, but obviously in a way that it's easy for people to decide. So it's a really interesting kind of data information story. We're going to have to layer it, and it's all about like what you want to know. Um, so that's the idea, is we want to make it really kind of personalised depending on what you need. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, yeah. and my last question would be about how um, how are you envisioning working with brands on this? Um, so, for example, um, if brands uh, find based on their data that they don't rank well, mm. uh, how, how, oh, how are you going to... I don't know that I have the answer yeah. to that question yet. Um, <laughs> we're starting to build it out at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think, actually, like that's what we want to do. We're not about shaming naming and shaming, it's more that we want to encourage people to start somewhere and to potentially start to build on that. Mm -hmm. And I think in that situation, if a brand is thinking that they're doing really sustainable things and potentially they're not, then one, I mean, let's work with them and maybe there's some things and gaps in knowledge, but also it's like, great, then there's some opportunity for improvement. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. And maybe everybody's got a sus score like on their products in the future. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Thank cool. you, Elise. Thank you very much. Thank you all. All right, next up we have Brittany Sales, who is going to be presenting her startup, Active Giving. Yes. It's solace, but I mean, sales works as well. We, like, we all like those. Um, okay, so how many of you guys either believe that climate change is an urgent need for humanity to solve um, or just like nature and like being in nature. Can I get a show of hands? Good, so I'm talking to you guys, everyone else, maybe a good time to take a bathroom break or something like that. Uh, but basically we've created a solution for those who want to contribute to a healthier planet, uh, but may not necessarily know how to do so within their daily life or daily habits. Um, active giving taps into everyone's sports routines, so fitness, uh, working out, yoga, running, hiking, and actually turns a calories burns or kilometers covered into trees that are planted in global reforestation projects. Uh, that's done in two ways. It's supported by brands who are looking to connect with an active and eco-conscious consumer. So any brand that would like to not only make an impact and make a connection with people who care about the environment, uh, but also plant trees while they're doing it. We also run individual um, operations or teams for organizations and companies that are looking to create a sense of community um, and a shared goal among remote teams that are working. This also works for different organizations that want to support a specific project and engage their team members within that organization to remain active in that time period of, of fundraising for a specific cause. We not only focus on these two app features, um, such as marketing and 
team hosts, uh, but we also have a strong emphasis on the data analytics in terms of the types of projects and the awareness that is generated for the projects amongst the community of people who are using the apps, and also influencer engagement or influencer marketing to create awareness for the brands that are actually supporting uh, the different projects and the users on the platform. In terms of the market opportunity itself, we have about 74% of consumers between 18 and 34 that believe well-being or wellness should be incorporated into a brand. So it's not purely about making a profit anymore, but what else can we do besides make a profit? And that opportunity is estimated by CB Insights to be up to uh, $4 trillion. So the story of active giving itself actually started off after the Idea One Techstars Startup Weekend last summer. Since then, it was launched as an Instagram campaign, which um, ca captured about 10,000 different activities. So these are people who are actually taking time to take a picture of their activity, send it in on Instagram, tag active giving, and from that, it generated a number of, uh, I would say, awareness from different sponsors on the platform. So actual brands who wanted to connect with people who were active and eco-conscious and sharing this information. So that validated the business model. Um, it scaled to a point where we couldn't be using Excel <laughs> to basically track these activities anymore. And so we turned it into an app. And it was launched publicly as of June 1st, so just a couple of months ago, and is continuing to gain traction. So we've had over 15 different companies that have participated with us either as sponsors or as different team hosts, and about six different projects that we're working with on the platform. Four of them themselves are actual traditional tree planting projects. Um, the other two focus on mobility, or one focuses on mobility. The other one is a green tech project that focuses on urban air quality. Our founding team itself is made up of nothing but pure superstars. <laughs> we have our head of product who has 10 years of experience working at both PayPal and Solaris Bank. We have Laurent who has previously founded a uh, active and fit community called Urban Art Run and Run Live, which is a fitness app itself. And myself with experience in corporate ven venture capital and corporate innovation. Um, and that's it. So the, the call to action is just to download the app right now. Whoever is watching, you can actually use these QR codes. They work. So <laughs> go ahead and do it. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Wonderful. How did you find your co-founders? Uh, the startup weekend, actually. So I was judging the competition uh, where one of my co-founders was pitching the idea. Um, and from that, just kind of got obsessed with the idea, couldn't stop thinking about it, and eventually joined them um, in order for us to set up the company and, and make it real. Really impressive traction so far. I, uh, what, what, is, uh, what is next? What are your next goals and how you want to grow the company? Yeah. I mean, so for us right now, we're really focused on, on bringing more users onto the app itself. Mm -hmm. um, I think influencer engagement and working with uh, different uh, individuals who really have the same passion as one of my co-founders, which was to um, you know, support a good cause and figure out how to do it with something more than just like capital or money, right? So he was actually on a bike trip through Europe and, and was biking for a specific cause and um, found out how difficult it was to make money and at the same time was using a ton of fitness apps and knew that there was data being monetized in that process. So it was kind of this connection of like, hey, why can't this be used or can we leverage this in one way or another? So we want to find more individuals who kind of have that same passion and can engage their community in the same way and bring more users onto the app itself. Um, and likewise, that'll support our business development activities at the same time. Mm -hmm. you, Go ahead. Where are most of your users? Where, where's your following really yeah. um, geographically? So it's definitely Berlin-based, um, then Germany overall. Mm -hmm. After that, the second largest market is in the US, which is happening pretty organically, good to hear. And then third, Belgium. So that also makes up the home locations of each one of the founding team members. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's nice. Mm -hmm. And, and what, are, uh, what are threats to your organization at this moment? It sounds like you're on a good path. It sounds like you're growing. It sounds like you have an initial uh, great team and, uh, and obviously traction with a lot of uh, Berlin and Belgian-based uh, organizations. But uh, what, uh, what's holding you back now? Yeah. Um, so we just need to grow as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have competitors. Uh, they do have a slightly different angle. Some of them are focused more on raising awareness for either poverty itself or hunger, 
um, but we focus solely on sustainability. So we do have to be very aware of you know, how our competitors choose to frame their messaging mm -hmm. um, through the same business model of this process that we're, we're working on. Um, we're also really trying to think of different ways to keep people active and engaged with the app and really using it and, and understanding this holistic picture of integrating sustainability into their daily life in, in a number of ways outside of just fitness. Yep. So. So it syncs with Strava, which is the most widely used running app at the moment, and then it just automatically uh, tracks your workouts, and then you get an email notification reminding you to complete the workout, which brings everyone into the app, and then you see how many trees are planted on behalf of your activities and who they were planted by, so the organization and the corporate sponsor that is planting those trees. Um, and then you can also enter the activity yourself. So if it's like a yoga session or HIT or CrossFit and you don't use any other uh, tracking device, then you can put in the time and it'll calculate the trees for you. Uh, or you, if you're on a run or on a bike ride, the app itself is GPS enabled, so it'll track your activity that way. Yeah. So how can you ensure that people are putting in accurate data? Yeah, I mean, so there's definitely, you can test in like a five, 10 minute run and fake it to a certain amount. Uh, but we also have limits. So if we see that someone's running like five marathons a day, like the system will you know, reject it. I'm sure there are superstars out there, but they should be talking to us personally, and then maybe we can work <laughs> something out. But like, other than that, um, yeah, we basically set limits because we can tell when there's a regular behavior in, in a workout. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies for the last name mix up. Uh, no, it's OK. <laughs> Took my it's glasses off. <laughs> All right, and uh, next up we have Sana Albadri, who's going to be telling us about her startup, Sage Fund. Welcome. Hi, my name is Sana, and I'm the founder of Sage Fund. So, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. The same applies to investing. This is because the market doubles in size every 10 years on average. This makes investing really the most powerful tool you have to grow your wealth. Shockingly, most people don't do it. So I was asking myself, how is something so powerful so neglected? And I found four, me, uh, four key misconceptions. One, investing is only for the rich. This isn't true. Thanks to the digitization of financial platforms, you can start w with a few hundred euros. Two, investing is inherently unethical. This also isn't true. In the past decade, there has been an explosion of sustainable options. Three, you risk losing all of your savings. Also not true. If you use sound investment principles, you can um, um, weather any bad market condition. And lastly, investing is only for experts. There is a little bit of truth. The financial industry is filled with poor um, in, in investment options and jargon. And even f fintechs try to sell you on the f false idea of, of getting rich fast. However, as a licensed financial advisor, I realized that it doesn't take much to help people make good choices. And I also realized that I can build a platform to solve all of those problems at once. So I would like to introduce you to Sage Fund, a digital platform that helps you grow your wealth sustainably. We use scientific principles to construct our portfolios, and everything runs on autopilot. All you need to do is save, be patient, and by the time you retire, you could be a, a, a millionaire. I'm not exaggerating. Really. <laughs> For launch, we partnered with a private bank to de deliver the perfect beginner's portfolio. Um, it, it consists of ETFs, and with just a few clicks, you could be investing in over 600 companies in plus 50 countries. It makes an average return of 3%, and you can start with only 500 euros. An independent rating agency has, it, it has given the portfolio an A-plus on sustainability. This is because we include companies involved in harmful practices like oil and gas, weapons, male-dominated boardrooms, and poor worker treatment. Shockingly, this means that 75% of companies floating on the market today don't make the cut. 
This means that with us, you would be investing in great companies like Tesla, Microsoft, and Unilever. And the cherry on the cake, sustainable investing makes you consistently more money, not less. So we've broken down everything for you and made the process as simple as possible. Within eight minutes, you could be an investor. So I would be really excited for you to sign up today to join our launch this fall. That's my pitch. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, can I ask you about uh, your milestones so far and your partnerships uh, that you're already setting up? Yeah, I'm still a little bit secret about revealing the private bank um, because we are we received the contracts. We actually have two different ones, and we're almost deciding who we're signing with. Um, both of them are basically the biggest uh, B2B financial uh, service providers that we work with. We also work with ESG analysts that help us cre create the portfolio. Um, I basically um, convinced them to help for free, <laughs> just um, out of being excited to support a startup. Um, but they are pros, they work for um, ISS and other very well-known agencies. Yeah. And you also didn't include ah, a slide. Ah, milestones. Oh, what's that? Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, I, I was going to say, you also didn't include a slide uh, that had your background on it. So yeah, if you my background. Give a little bit of team information. That would yes, be good. I would love to give that. So, my background is in psychology. Um, and then I worked for as a user researcher for startups. I also worked for an NGO, um, and I was executive assistant, so I really know a lot about the space. Then my co-founder, he is a successful startup founder. He made a um, web shop selling nootropics. Our engineer, he built a B2B solution for investment professionals to, to help screen for sustainable investments. So all of us are kind of really co connected to the space, yeah. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your competition and what sets you apart from them? Yeah, so the robo-advisor space is still quite small and it's a recent space in the financial industry. Um, our main competitors would be something like Scalable Capital, um, Vantec and probably uh, Peaks and other like savings apps. But they target a very different audience. So Scalable's audience is predominantly male, like 90%. A third of them are bankers, and they are quite rich and financially literate. Um, we have a totally different approach. Like We focus on women, people who are interested in sustainability. And like imagine the people who shop at Al Natura or whatever. They are educated, they are affluent, but they're not targeted at all by financial, um, by digital solutions. So we will be really shifting the space, yeah. yeah. And can you speak a little bit about uh, customer acquisition and your ideas there? Yeah, I mean, this is the biggest challenge that we have. It's a consumer product, and it's a really tough choice to invest. Um, so far, I have uh, over 200 people that are in my com com uh, community and other challenge mm -hmm. and other ch channels that I'm speaking to, um, and they seem they have indicated high interest to invest, and they, they will be also our beta testers. We actually don't need um, too many users to be sustainable, mm -hmm. because when people choose to invest in like a long-term solution, it's quite a high account size. So for this reason, 200 is actually quite a lot. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And what do you need to do with the team? Do you need to scale the team as well, or is that also? I think so far we don't need to scale the team very much um, because our system is really cheap on the op 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 operations side. I think the focus has to be really on marketing, on user education, on content. Um, th th there's really a lot to be done, especially in, in Germany. There isn't really much um, beautiful, relatable, lifestyle-focused communication on how investments work. Um, how to plan your finances, how to think about your finances. This is a really unoccupied space. So we are thinking of being thought leaders there. Excellent, thank you. Thank Any you. more questions? Thanks. No, thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you to our in-house participants, I'd like to say. We are now moving online. We have two stealth mode participants who will be pitching virtually. 
Uh, we're going to start off with Daria Ivinsky and Thanky. So if we could get her onto the stream. Hi, everyone. Do you see me? Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah. So I'm just trying. Yeah. Um, so I have been working in the cultural sphere since 2016. And you know what? No matter Berlin or Moscow, cultural managers face the same problem, lack of business and marketing skills. University programs are outdated. Business courses are irrelevant. So I thought, what if I build a learning platform for cultural managers that will help them to gain business and marketing skills in an engaging way? So my name is Daria and uh, uh, four years ago I changed my life and uh, left corporate world for the arts. I started in a major private museum in Moscow, then I moved to, uh, moved to key theaters in Moscow, and my last position was head of marketing in the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts, which is one of the largest world arts museums in Russia. My last campaign there won EFI, which is Global Marketing Award. Uh, throughout my journey, I realized how big is skill gap between culture uh, in, in the culture and arts. And that's why I developed few um, programs for cultural managers in top Russian universities. One of them was an accelerator for 250 um, cultural leaders um, throughout Russia. Uh, so my mission is to help them gain relevant business skills. My co-founder is Sophia. She is a, a learning experience designer and also she is a methodologist and a mediator and mentor. This March, uh, like in the very <laughs> beginning of the COVID situation, we launched our own educational uh, education business, Soda Bureau. And since then, uh, we our programs have been um, so. Since then, yeah, 120 um, students have graduated from our pilot strategic marketing course, and more than 1,500 people have attended our online um, discussions. So our idea is to build a learning platform to provide cultural managers with relevant business skills through bite-sized, fun, and professionally designed education programs. So imagine Babeli, but for cultural managers as a metaphor. Um, there are 10, more than 10 and a half million people uh, who study or work in the cultural sphere in Europe. And uh, our business model is subscription-based. So um, at a subscription fee of 80 euros per year, our potential available market is almost 1 billion euros. We would like to build a prototype in next two weeks and test it among cultural managers from, uh, from the UK, France, Italy, and Germany. But our big ambition is to become a number choice platform of a learning, uh, of a learning platform for cultural managers within five years. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Daria. Mm -hmm. Did you want to start? Okay. I, yeah. I, yeah, I always have a question. <laughs> I, I have a lot of questions. So um, this is a very specific audience, and it sounds like you already have an in uh, to talking with a lot of them. Um, how are you going to target you know, the ones who are not already part of your network? Um, so that's a very good question. But um, so I came to the stealth mode with another product and uh, another platform. And with it, so it, in the last three months, I have built my new network here in Berlin uh, with art managers from Germany and also not only in Germany, from all over the world. And so in last two weeks, I have already talked to uh, more than 20 cultural managers from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's not that uh, hard to build network and to find new users as that's my job. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, it's not that, um, so it, it's just like networking and marketing thing and conferencing and uh, mm -hmm. all this stuff. So mm -hmm. very simple one. 
Can you explain a little bit about the content that needs to be created? I've, is it very specific and tailored? You're addressing different cultural managers in different geographies. Who's creating the content? How much work does that involve? How does it look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I have already developed several um, several courses, but they are not like, so they were like typical or standard education courses in universities. They are more business and marketing specific, but for cultural managers. So on their own language and with their with that type. Uh, so it's about marketing strategy, communication strategy, fundraising, uh, financial management, and uh, um, like acceleration of your startup if you would like to start in a cultural sphere. And uh, um, this um, this content is specific. It is always create. It is created by me and my colleagues, and also Sophia helps me uh, with all methodology method methodology part. So it's uh, like very uh, high professional learning experience. And uh, uh, if we talk about this platform, so we will take our top products and test it there. Uh, but from the very beginning, we'll start with English, um, and we will translate them on in, in English, but then we will think about going to other countries to people who don't know English. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about your revenue model and how many customers you need in order to be a profitable business and to grow? Uh, it depends because um, if we talk about, so for me now, it's uh, more about moving from service model to product model of mm -hmm. my business that I already have in Russia. Yeah. So uh, now we are profitable and mm -hmm. uh, we are growing as we have uh, launched it uh, this March only. Uh, and for us, it will be more about developing a very simple prototype version, which is free for us. And then to see uh, what will be the model and what will be our KPIs, because now we don't understand how uh, people will react. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I just, I have so many unknown things now in my head and I need just to test and to understand. Uh, but like, yeah, so we think that subscription model will be good, but uh, our revenue and our business model will depend on our first expenditures to the product, whether we need it or not, mm -hmm. whether we need more people or not. And do you have competition in this market? Um, are there others who are working in this space? Yeah, we have uh, not products, uh, all services. Uh, if we talk about, so we have university programs which are outdated and even people who, um, who ended Bakari, which is one of the top cultural management universities with top programs, they said that marketing and business parts of these programs are really, are, are not relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. Also, we have uh, different independent workshops and agencies who can, who work with museums or with culture or, or with more like designs and architecture uh, teams. And also, of course, we have some online courses, but all of them, so we have some in, uh, competition uh, among independent online courses, but also there is Coursera with um, mm -hmm. like two courses there, uh, but all of them, you know, like they, they don't feel, uh, so they're not that fast as we would like to be. Mm -hmm. We want to have a very fast, fun, bite-sized product on the platform, like on learning language platforms. And that's why we think that it will be better to have this product, not a service like many other competitors have. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thank you, Daria. Thank you. Hope thank to you. see you soon in person. Yeah, me too. All right, and next up, last but not least, we have Victoria Ellis Ardelt, who is going to tell us about Trackham. Hi, um, <clears throat> sorry. Hi, everybody. Great to see you all. Uh, and uh, I'm very sorry not to be there in person. Bonjour from France. And tonight I'm going to be addressing the question I've been asking myself for the past few months, where can I go? Um, <laughs> so what does where can I go mean? What is the problem? In the past few months, we've been doing this quite intensely, that uncertainties between countries uh, lead to travel restrictions, travel bans. This obviously has a negative impact on society, on the economy, 
and on how we're running politics in general. Moreover, when you want to be keeping up to speed uh, with, uh, with all the travel bans which is happening, it's time consuming. There's a lot of sources to be looking at. And I'm sure a lot of you have already been onto the website of numerous foreign ministries to look at where you want to be going or how. And you, know, you sometimes get confused in the detail. So what was the solution? I was thinking to myself, for where can I go? Now, needed to, I wanted to construct an automated pl platform which would be providing a one-stop place with all the information quickly and real-time updates. And importantly, it needed to be user-friendly. So who is impacted by this aside from you and me, the traveler? Well, companies in general with l uh, long supply chains in different countries, um, companies with offices and partners abroad, sectors in particular, tourism, logistics, and international organizations, and NGOs with partners and offices around the world, and also projects around the world. Um, this, when I come to the potential users, we might be all still thinking in a COVID mindset for the moment, but this actually was a problematic, which I noted prior to this. Companies, as a, when I was a, uh, as a consultant, I noted that I was searching for companies, this pieces of information in times of crisis. Hence, looking into it further was bringing me to thinking of what could be the potential solutions. I'll be, this is now what the platform will be looking like. These are the mockups. We start off by selecting our location because this is important. Where are you res residing? What is your time space of when you're going to be traveling? And obviously what type of travel you might be doing that if you're doing business travel, you will have different reglementations if you're allowed to travel or not, than if you're, for example, just wanting to go to, for tourism. The result will be on your left, I believe it's on your left, um, uh, uh, this on the platform. Here we have chosen Germany as our location and as our destination, either France or Spain. We wanted to, I wanted to ensure that you could have an idea of what it would be looking at what is the situation in a color-coded way, so you would get a very fast impression, okay, it's green, there are no travel restrictions for the moment in France, orange, there are restrictions towards Spain um, for, for the moment, but also seeing what were the neighboring countries that uh, around you, depending on what type of travel you were going to be doing. Then below we have the details of what is it going to look like specifically. We have all been following the cases of COVID in North Rhine, uh, in North Rhine Westphalia, where Austria pointed uh, put on re uh, restrictions and warnings towards just one region. And this is really to address this type of change that we've been seeing. So it's not just a country, but it's in uh, specific regions. Here you see that there's still color uh, on the gradient. Below you have the information of what you would need to be doing. Um, would you need to be self-isolating? Would you need to be putting on a mask when you come back? Um, do you need a vaccination if you're going there? And there's more information to be available. This will obviously be mobile, and there'll obviously be a moment where you can chat and send yourself the, uh, with, with, us, with me and with others behind the platform. Send yourself your research and also send yourself alerts because these decisions can be taken fast and quickly and so that you're always on top of things when you're traveling or when your team is traveling or when your supply chain is abroad um, what, what situations you need to be taking into account as mentioned there are different customer segments so this requires different business models the tailored in-house solution which is really targeted towards the needs of a specific client the platform with advertising and the subscription model Last but not least, the API to be integrated into potential websites. Um, we, uh, we are now looking in towards what are the next steps for the product. So I'm going to be testing the product, building the, uh, uh, getting it, uh, uh, testing out the business hypothesis, also adapting the code and pro uh, adapting the product and the code based on the feedback on this testing phase, then testing it and then launching it and then adding further features because I'm not planning, uh, because in the future, I would like to add further political features that we can have around the world, trade restrictions, giving companies then an overview of what is happening when uh, the, for their supply chain or their products when there is a, uh, a trade restriction there. So this is in a nutshell, what, how I'm trying to answer the question, where can I go? Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the questions.
How are you consolidating all this data? I mean, it resides in so many different places on government websites, etc. How do you scrape all that data together and make sure it's up to date? Well, this is uh, the automated, uh, the automation side, and this will be one thing that we're going to be working. Uh, I'm going to be working in with the coder and with developers on this side. Um, it is possible to scrape for keywords the different websites and ensure that it is automated. It's going to be a bit of trial and error, but the intention is that it uh, it will be automated in the uh, in the law, in the medium run. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more about your team uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, as you are growing, uh, how you uh, how you see expanding your team? For the moment, it's just me. I've been working with the designer, and I'm looking with uh, working in uh, with coders and developers too. But I do plan on growing the team uh, because this is the objective for a sustainable company, um, and looking in towards coding, developing, because there's going to be a lot of that, which is going to have to be done, but also with people who have this expertise and knowledge of what are the key, to, uh, what is going on in the world of the analysis and the political analysis to do that. Okay. How are people going to find out about the app? Um, well, there's going to be a first phase of me um, getting in touch with the key targets, uh, with target uh, clients. This is going to be the first step. Then there's going to be um, then there's going to be uh, on the basis of that um, either a mix of marketing um, and uh, and also a lot of uh, yes a lot of going out and talking to people and building out there a lot of word of mouth too. And can you talk about revenue model? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was sure. I was fascinated about the COVID uh, example. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit more about um, what you expect for the, the the period after COVID? You gave some some examples. You touched on it, but just give us idea an, an idea of how the market, uh, as you think about it, would look like like in five or ten years. Um, I think uh, that the market. Um, I think we have actually a very short term memory. Um, I think that uh, there will be still. Uh, long supply chains in different countries. I think we will still be traveling differently, but we still will be. We will be though more cautious about how we're doing it. We will want to be more informed because this is what this phase will have, uh, the, the COVID pandemic will have taught us. That is how I foresee it for the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then if you could if you could speak to revenue models. So it sounds like you're, you're going to companies um, and offering as an API, for example. Um, mm -hmm. what, uh, what do you see as uh, your offer to them uh, and, and how will you um, get into the business? Is it uh, like a freemium or is it, uh, is it something that you see them uh, just bringing in as a, as a service? Um, I see it as a service, um, bringing the possibility of if you're, for example, booking or traveling, mm -hmm. or uh, you want to, uh, you as a user want to know what is coming on uh, towards it, what type of insurance you should be using, will it be valid? It is that sort of angle, for example, that I'm looking into. Uh, into um, then there is the the um, as mentioned the the targeted um, sort of the tailored approach. So as a company, you'd have your dashboard, so to speak of what is going on in the world and for the key countries that you're interested in. And then, um, and then the, uh, and then uh, the um, subscription model where you would have um, the, uh, you would have access to more detailed access to the platform giving you uh, during a specific period of time. So it might be just whilst you're traveling or throughout the whole year, but without the tailoring at that point in time. And then there's the advertising. So that you'd be accessing the platform, but with access, uh, with limit, with limited access on the information and with more advertising towards it. Okay. These are the models that I'm considering for the moment, sort of a, co a combination of all four of these. Yeah. Right. And and your uh, internal customer. Uh, this is a person who's in logistics or is in HR. Where where do you see your your champion in a company? Um, I see my champion, um, depending obviously on the form of, the, uh, of what type of company it is, okay. if it is a company which has its employees all around the world, then in the HR department, mm -hmm. that is where I will be going. If it is a company which is based, for example, um, is an SME where most of its employees are based in one place, however, they have a very long supply chain, I would be looking into the logistics uh, okay. section. So it's very much of which company we're going to be going at. 
Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you. Thanks. Greetings to France. All right. Well, that wraps up the pitches. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the panelists, the jury, um, everyone that was involved in Stealth Mode 1, people that are coming on board for Stealth Mode 2 were very, very chuffed and excited for the next round. As I said, we opened up applications this week or last week on the 22nd, so please tell your friends, tell your family. We want to see everyone, really ambitious women, come out out of out of the, all of the forests that we have around here, every nook and cranny in this country abroad, we're already seeing some incredible applications coming in from really from Canada. We saw some from Asia. So the reach is there. It's really, really exciting. We know there's so much untapped potential out there. There's so much knowledge and expertise, and we really want to embolden you and bring people into the limelight. So thanks to the participants for being our guinea pigs this first time around. We are going to learn from you. It was hard, I know, but uh, we all made it through and we made it here on stage together. So thanks for all your patience uh, and for making Stealth Mode a reality. And we really look forward to all, all the next editions. So have a good evening and we'll see you in a few months. Thank you.